Amen. Very beautiful. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning indeed, and welcome to Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. This is our first of three services here on our campus today, and of course we're joined by others who are worshiping with us online. I know we have several guests today, and we want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you are here. Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church has a vision to bring in and to build up and to reach out and that's what we seek to do and as you gather for worship we encourage all members and guests alike to register your attendance and pass that connection pad down we're so glad that you're here and know you'll be blessed today as we have a sacrament the sacrament of baptism later in the service today and receiving new members as well not only in this service but in the later service here in the sanctuary uh, also so a wonderful day here at Christ of the Hills we're so glad that you are here uh, we have the weekly ringer. Many of you have that electronically on Friday, and some of you have it in your hand, and it's filled with items that are coming up in the life of the church. I do want to make mention, as we did last week as well, I don't know how many of you may have seen the Today Show on Friday and our own Kathy Sanders uh, with Katie Couric there on the Today Show. Uh, as many of you know, maybe not all of you know, but Kathy lost her two young grandsons in the Oklahoma City bombing. And she's written a lot about that, but, but one book in particular, Now You See Me. And uh, her HBO documentary will be aired this Tuesday. So, so be looking for that about the American bombing. It's a story of great tragedy, of course, and great heartbreak, but also an inspirational story that Kathy shares. So look for that this week, this Tuesday, because Friday is the uh, 29th anniversary, right? 29th anniversary of that bombing. So uh, be, be looking for that. All right, let's stand together and join in our responsive call to worship. And this call to worship comes from the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. who satisfies you with good as long as you live. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. It's Easter time for us, and we're going to be singing hymn number 318 as you remain standing. Let's join in song.
Our affirmation of faith today is number 883. You may want to turn there. This is not the Apostles' Creed that we'll use later in the baptismal service, but this is the Statement of Faith of the United Church of Canada. It's number 883. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. We have several joys and concerns that we want to share with you this morning. And if you have joys and concerns you want to lift up, we do have prayer cards in the pews. You can uh, let us know through there or you can contact the office and we'll be glad to share those with the congregation. This morning our altar flowers are given to the glory of God by Kathy Jervis in memory of her parents, John and Olivia Casper, and by Ron Felger in celebration of his wife, Kathy Felger's birthday. Happy birthday, Kathy. <laughs> the flowers in the Welcome Center are given to the glory of God by Judy Pruitt in honor of her granddaughter, Emma Davis. And we have an addition here we want to lift up. We want to extend our sympathy to Ellie Majeski on the death of her sister, Beth Kelly. We want to continue to keep that family in our prayers. Also, uh, Steve Bush has been uh, moved back to the hospital, so we want to continue to pray for Steve during this time. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we come into your presence and we pause from the many activities that have kept us busy this past week. We come to rest from the worries and cares of life. We come to continue our journey with you, a journey that fills our hearts with your love and lifts our spirits when everything seems hopeless. And we thank you for being with us. This week has been filled with times of laughter and tears, times of awe and amazement, times of stillness and silence. This week, we've listened to help calm and soothe the cares of others, and we've shared kind words with strangers and friends. We have these moments many times, and in these moments, we're able to share you and witness to our love for you and your love for us. These are the times when people can see you in us and through us, and we pray that we will be so open and so transparent that when people look at us, they see you. We ask an extra blessing to be upon those in our church and community who need a special touch from you. People in our church, our community, and our world are struggling with hurts, some of which we understand and some we don't. And we lift them up to you. You're the only one who can heal them and give them what they need to keep going. As we continue our worship today, may we open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to what you want to say to us. And in response, may we open ourselves to meet the needs we see every day. We know that you want all of your children to have this special relationship with you. Guide us to the people who need that relationship, and may they experience you through our deeds and our words. We lift up our prayers to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you.
y'all know when you clap, you're not clapping for them. They're doing what they're called to do. And that's to send a message of music. And what we get to do is we get to praise God as they send that message. And so when, they, when they're finished, the ex, yeah, that goes to them because they do such a great job. But we praise God this day because he is alive. He is alive. Let's praise God through the word of God. Passage of scripture this morning is from the third chapter of the book of Acts, verses 1 through 21. And here is the holy word of God. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So at that time, so, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Nothing I desire 
Amen. Please bow for our offertory prayer this morning. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, this morning we joyfully present to you our tithes and offerings. We know that everything is at your disposal and you, the creator of the universe, are not dependent on us. Lord, now we ask that you please receive this humble offering that we joyfully give. It is our desire to honor you out of our increase to show that you reign in our hearts and lives. Thank you, Lord, that you gave your all for our ransom. And it was in that incredible gift that we now can have the assurance of eternal life. May we honor you in all that we do as we advance your kingdom here on earth. In the holy name of Jesus, the risen lamb, we pray. Amen. You may be seated, please, and I'm going to invite Mark and Cindy Cheatham to come up now for the sacrament of baptism. You know, since our average age is a little above childbearing age, I don't do near as many baptisms as I used to do of infants coming in, so we're going to do everything with our baptismal service. I'm going to ask the congregation, because you're going to have a part in this as well, to turn to number 33 in your hymnal and follow with us through the liturgy of the baptismal covenant. Guys, if you'll just come and turn right here. There you go. Mark, you get on this side. Because I'm going to be closer to you. No, you go over there, Cindy. 
We're going to practice and get this right, aren't we? (laughs) Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And all this is God's gift offered to us without price. And it's a wonderful joy today that I introduce to you Mark Kevin Cheatham as a candidate for baptism. And also his wife Cindy Cheatham is going to be joining Christ of the Hills today by transfer from another denomination. So Mark, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you three questions, actually four questions. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. According to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? And now on page 35, the congregation, I'm going to turn these questions to you. Do you as Christ's body, the church, Reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your Spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water, and he who receives it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. All praise to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit 
lives and reigns forever. Amen. Mark, would you bow please there and kneel at the chancel? Mark, Kevin, Cheatham, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you, Mark, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may stand. Cindy, you come forward. Now, Cindy, I'm going to ask you, will you be a faithful member of Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church? With five things, and I'll ask you both these questions. Will you support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? We welcome you as the newest members of Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. Now, congregation, turn over to page 38, right there at the bottom. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith and confirm their hope and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Cindy, and welcome. He's not a handshaker, huh? And Mark, I've got a baptismal certificate for you. You guys may go up. Thank you so much. And now we're going to sing about baptism. Take the small hymnal, the, the, the smaller hymnal, the faith we sing hymnal, and turn to number 2248, baptized in water. And I invite you now to stand as we sing. Please be seated. Peter said to him, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. So healing at Gate Beautiful, from prayer 
to heal her. Last Sunday, I began a series of messages for the 50 days that in our church liturgy we know as Eastertide, between Easter Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. And I'm focusing on what I'm calling the post-resurrection Simon Peter. Now, to be sure, Peter is a very familiar figure, especially the Simon Peter of the four Gospels. We meet him first by the Sea of Galilee with his brother Andrew and that other set of brothers, James and John, as Jesus calls them from fishing on the Sea of Galilee to fish for people. In one of the storm stories of the Galilee, we learn Peter best. Matthew takes us from the terror of the waves to the thrill of faith that rides on the waves as Peter steps out of the boat and walks with Jesus. The Simon Peter, then, that we know from the Gospels is brash and bold. Yet he reminds us also that we are all susceptible to failure. As the brave one famously denies Jesus three times on the night he was betrayed, the night before his crucifixion. So the Simon Peter of the Gospels we know very well. This series, though, will focus on post-resurrection Simon Peter. And these are stories from the book of Acts primarily that I think it fair to say are relatively less well-known. Not completely uh, absent from our knowledge, of course. We know these stories, but not as well-known as the gospel stories. So what becomes of Simon Peter after Jesus has been crucified and is resurrected? We began last Sunday with a final visit to the Sea of Galilee. Peter, he wanted space to ponder all that he had witnessed, all that he had experienced. There was the terror of Gethsemane, the arrest. There was the shame of his own denials. There was the grief of watching his Lord die on the cross. And then there's the thrill of the resurrection and the questions of what is this going to mean for me. And so Peter, wanting to space to ponder all of this, goes fishing. And there, in a seaside breakfast, with the resurrected Jesus as host and chef, Peter is recommissioned. Three times Jesus asks him, Simon, son of John. I've always claimed Peter as a cousin. Since what is son of John but Johnson, right? <laughs> right? That's what Jesus said by the sea. Simon Johnson, three times, do you love me? And three times Peter confesses his love. Lord, you know that I love you. And with each one, Jesus says, feed my sheep. So Simon Peter, the fisherman, is now the church's chief shepherd. So the first sermon last week then was a transition by the Sea of Galilee from the fisher to the shepherd. Now the next thing in chronological order would be the second chapter of Acts, which is the day of Pentecost. And Peter's inspiring sermon on the day of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit and those tongues of fire descends on the disciples and empowers the church as the initial pop, if you would, of the church, not Three new members, like we're going to receive at least three new members today. Two we just did and one in the next service here. But 3,000 new members on that day after Peter's sermon. And we're going to loop back to Pentecost Sunday, obviously, on the end of Eastertide, which is the day of Pentecost. But today we're going to skip right over Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost. And we're going to land in the third chapter of Acts, the passage that Pastor Steve read uh, a moment ago where we find Peter and John going up to the temple to pray, the fixed hour prayer, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they pass through one of the gates called Beautiful. And in this second message, we're going to see another transition in Peter's life. We saw him the fisher and now the shepherd. Now we're going to see him as the prayer transitioned into a healer. Peter and John, I've been thinking a lot this week about this pair. And they're going to the temple. Remember now, there's no church building. There's no Methodist church at the corner of 6th and Main. The church is in its first days, in its very infancy. Still a lot of growing up to do to discover its unique identity. While at the same time knowing that it's nurtured in the soil 
the spiritual soil that they sprang from, which is Judaism. So that even today, with the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament, what we call the Old and, and New Testaments of our sacred word as people of the book, we see ourselves as sharing a, Judea, a Judeo-Christian worldview, a Judeo-Christian faith, a Judeo-Christian culture. So going up to the temple, Peter and John still attached to the temple, they encounter a lame man who is carried daily and laid at the gate of the, the, the gate called Beautiful to beg for alms. And one suspects there were many beggars there every day. Then, as today, those seeking assistance from the generosity of, uh, of others tend to congregate at places where others will be and where others might be in a mood to uh, hand out assistance. What but the Spirit of God would have prompted Peter to look so intently on this one lame beggar? But he does, and he says, look at us. Now this element of the story has been fascinating to artists. I've given you two examples. I encourage you to look at those two examples now. One from the 17th century uh, that's in Rome now from Monsolutions and the other from the 15th century from Mussolino de Panicale that is in Florence. These are both uh, images, and, and I've, I've studied this week uh, paintings, artistic depictions of this event told in Acts chapter 3, of at least a dozen, maybe more than a dozen. But I chose these two to, to share with you. And one of the interesting common features, I think, of, of these and other artistic depictions Beyond the cripple being on the ground and the reaching out of the hand and the, t the main characters here, but the fixing of the eyes, that phrase really captivated the artist just as it probably captivated you and certainly did me. Look at us. Look at us. So uh, let's go with the bottom image first. It's the less dramatic of the two images. Peter here is taking the lead. John stands to his side, and this painting, as I said, is less dramatic than the top painting, and this seems to be at the moment of Peter's uh, uh, statement, look at us. Peter hasn't yet reached out to grab the other by the right arm, so let's do that. Let's look here, and notice that the eyes of those in conversation behind are sort of oblivious to what's going on. You see them? They're just talking. It's a regular day. Beggars come. Those needing assistance come. And they sit there, but it's a regular day. And you see life beyond in the distance. You see a little child there by the hand with a family. They all have their own cares. They all have their own lives. This is just a daily sight. And these others, it's not that they don't care. They wish they could help all of these if they could. But life goes on. And perhaps these even intentionally avoid eye contact. Unlike Peter who said, look at us. That had to be unusual. Most would avoid eye contact. Have you ever done that? Driving in Hot Springs or in Little Rock and, and you see someone on the side of the road needing assistance and kind of sometimes even change lanes so I'm not in the lane right next to them, you know. So avoiding eye contact is, is quite natural. But Peter said, look at us. So Peter and John here in this bottom image are, are marked by halos for their sainthood and they are offering a hand you see Peter's hand here and that's what we do in our ministries that's what we do in the dollar a week offering I talked so much about last week and the many other uh, ministries local and from our own church of course but also supporting local ministries we're offering a hand to those who need that hand but now I want you to look at the top image and it's much more dramatic I think the conversation here has already taken place. Look at us, and, and I'm sure this, this lame man expected a, a large donation. People don't just come up and say, look at me, unless they're going to offer me something. And Peter said, silver and gold have we none. But so, this is the king. Of my, 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 always my head goes back to the King James language. Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have we give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So here, Peter has already taken the right hand. The Bible says they, they, they connected with their right hand to pick him up. 
So Peter has taken the right arm and lifted him up. His ankles are getting stronger. The physician Luke is the author of the book of Acts, and he makes this medical appraisal, as it were, of this miracle. His ankles are getting stronger so that he can stand up. Now, again, in the top image, you see in the background daily life. You see those two guys in the background there uh, just, just talking, not looking at the, at the lame man at all, just talking to each other and in a conversation. So this seems to be a common feature of artistic uh, depictions of this. Oblivious. People are oblivious to what's going on. Always, when something sacred is going on around us, there are those who just don't have eyes to see it. They're just oblivious to the work of God's Spirit. But Lucian's here gives us a twist in the 17th century. At first, and I'll ask you the question, at first when I looked at this painting, and I'm thinking Peter and John, right? I thought Peter and John were the two most prominent there. Peter is obvious, right? He's grabbed the hand of the lame man. I thought John was this one who's kind of standing back amazed. But that's not the case at all. Not the case at all. John is not this one, but the one dressed sort of like Peter in blue, off to the side. John off to the side, dressed in simple blue, looking at this lame man just as Peter is, his hands extended but more meekly. He's barefoot, by the way, like Peter. Simple garments, unlike that surprised man, that those garments are more rich. And the, the, this is a Jerusalemite. This is... A, this surprised man is a symbol, I think, for all those who were amazed. John, though, back in the background there, is tender, almost feminine, by the way, almost a feminine look there. This is what Leonardo da Vinci did famously, of course, in the famous painting of The Last Supper. And then I, online I saw something that you're not going to be able to see here, but if you call this up online, you'll see it. And I had totally missed it, and that is there's a thin silver line over Peter's head. You, you might barely be able to see that to mark him as Peter. And over that one that I've just called John in the background, receded into the background, you can't really see it here well, but if you call it up online, you can see that same silver line so that he is identified as, as John. The, who is then this one in the red? He also is making eye contact and his hands are up. He's elegantly dressed, shoes. I think this symbolizes the crowd in their amazement. Those who will soon after the lame man begins to walk and leap and praise God, this will be the newest member of the church. Mark, this is you. Newest member of the church. Wow, I can't believe this has just happened. See something I want to be a part of. That's what this man was. And the church was adding uh, through, this, through this miracle. Astonished then, like this man with his hand up, the people quickly surround Peter and John and the newly healed man in Solomon's portico. That's a colonnade on the east side of the temple enclosure. But now before we look at Peter's sermon, I just want to have a brief word about that. I want to say something about Peter and John. Thinking of John here sort of receded into the background that seems fascinating to me. God put these two together. From the very beginning, John and Peter are together, more so than Peter and Andrew, who's actually his blood brother. It's Peter and John. As different as they are in character, in temperament, in the gifts that they possess that can impact the church of God, they're so different. And yet God puts them together. Peter was outgoing and brave and bold, jumping into the lead. He was a man of action. John was more laid back, serene, quiet, contemplative, reflective. He was tender. He calls himself in the Gospel of John, not by his own name, but the disciple whom Jesus loved. So Peter was a doer. He would jump right in and do things and ask questions later. Deal with the consequences. John was more of a dreamer, even a mystic, pondering deep and spiritual things. In his own writing in the Gospel of John, we see this coming through. Not like the other Gospels. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels, meaning they see the Jesus story in the same way. John stood apart, that fourth Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It takes you into a mystic realm, into connection with the book of Genesis. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. John's so unique. And then, of course, John, in exile on the island of Patmos, writes the book of Revelation. And you don't get much more unique than that. 
So that's John. Recall the story of how these two are the two that ran to the tomb to check out the report of the women that Jesus, that the tomb was empty. John was younger than Peter and outran him. But guess who went into the tomb first? Peter may have gotten there two or three minutes later. John's the faster runner. But John just stands in amazement and said, whoa, I got to think about what just happened here. Peter runs right in. And then comes right out and keeps on running because he's so confused by what he saw and what it means in his life. John stood there and pondered what all this strangely arranged and folded napkins means. And, and uh, so, so they're different. Peter was preparing to change the world by action. John was preparing to change the world by writing a sermon. I'm going to talk about this. And you remember the story on the Sea of Tiberias last week in John 21 when Peter was confused. They were out in there fishing and Peter's confused of who that is out there on the shore telling us to throw the nets on the other side and cooking breakfast. And who is it? It's John who recognizes first that's Jesus and says it's Jesus. What does Peter do? He jumps right in and he swims to the shore. If John was quicker to recognize the truth, Peter was quicker to act upon that truth and jump right in. So these two men are opposites in many ways, in temperament, in the gifts they possess, but they're complementary because in common they share a desire to use whatever gifts they have for the glory of God. And I emphasize that to say that the church, as the body of Christ, is made up of a diversity of people. We bring our unique gifts and passions, though, to bear. No matter what temperament and act, no matter what our, our characteristics are, we each have our gifts that belong to us. And if we bring them all to the, to the kingdom of God, it is a blessing. And through it, God accomplishes His purpose. So when the crowds gather at Solomon's portico, Peter at first clarifies what's happening. He states that don't, don't think this happened because we're good people and we're pious, and we're righteous, and we did this by our own power, but this was done by faith in the name of the resurrected Jesus. And he echoed themes from the previous chapter, Acts chapter 2, that we'll come back to on Pentecost, as Peter interprets Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection within the framework of Israel's history and scriptures. Jesus was Jewish, Peter was Jewish, John was Jewish. This is not a new God, Peter is saying to the people. This is the same God, the ancestors, the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is your God, the author of all this that has taken place. And Peter acknowledges that the people and their rulers acted in ignorance when they handed Jesus over to death, but it wants to make the emphatic the point that God used their actions to for fulfill what they had foretold through the prophets that the Messiah would suffer. So for Peter, human culpability for Jesus' death is always held in tension with the inevitability of that death as part of God's sovereign plan. And then he says something very interesting, and I want to close with this. Peter says, I want to call you to repentance to change your mind about this so that you might experience a time of refreshing. I looked at that early this morning. I've, I've been intrigued by that phrase, a time of refreshing. The only time in the Greek New Testament that word refreshing, anasuksis, is used. And, and interesting, Peter himself had experienced through his own shame and guilt and repentance for having denied Christ, a time of refreshing, lifting him up from the shame of his actions. And he knew it was possible to be restored. Refreshing. You know, we, we live in a day of technology, right? You got your computer in front of you most of the day, probably. And you can always hit Control F5 if you want to refresh. There's my little computer tip for you. Control F5. And what's the, what's the icon for refreshing? It's an arrow that's in the form of a circle. Bring you back to the first. And that's what Peter experienced that we saw last week by the Sea of Galilee. It was a time of refreshing. Through his sorrow and repentance, he started all over again. As Jesus said, now, I want you to lead. Take the lead. You're the leader. I want you to take the lead in this kingdom of God, the church. May we find that time of refreshment by God's Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
All right, our final hymn is going to be number 159. We'll omit the third stanza, okay? We'll sing first, second, and fourth stanzas of number 159. Of course, always if there are those who desire to unite, have been praying about uniting with Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church, encourage you, uh, let us know that. and We'd love to get to know you better. We want you to know us better and have all your questions about our church and its mission, its purpose, its vision uh, to be answered. So let us know that. We would love to visit with you. Okay, lift high the cross, all but the third stanza. Let's stand together as we sing. Now, I hope you'll come join us in Fellowship Hall for a time of coffee and, and uh, cookies and otherwise refreshment, the refreshment of our fellowship together and our conversation. Please come and join us before these next two services. Would you now receive the benediction? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Now let us join hands as we sing the Lord's Prayer together. Amen.